We talked about the title of this is Delivering Research Project to Patients, and that's actually what I'm going to focus on in large part is some of the work we did to um, take some of the research we've done and some of the needs assessments that were done in San Francisco and develop a new program which is now known as the Golden Compass Program at Ward 86, which just formally launched in January. So not not a data center talk because I'm hoping to come back and present some of the outcomes and findings we have, but really we're going to talk about some of the highlights and challenges in starting this type of program and clinic. And I think talking to people here the last two days, I think part of what why we're talking about this is what is the best model of care now that um, majority of people, half are living, are over age 50 and are really not just dealing with HIV but other chronic conditions, and what is the role of the HIV specialist, the role of primary care, um, how can we make more integrated and more patient-centered care, as Jules talked about. And I'm going to give one example, um, but I think this will be a great area of discussion if I think there's different ways of doing things. Um, and as someone who trained in both geriatrics and did an HIV fellowship and has worked in both settings, I actually feel like there's a lot of similarities between the two fields, especially in Ryan White funded um, care clinics with wraparound services. There's a lot of similarities with focusing on social determinants of health, both in HIV medicine and in geriatric medicine. And I think there's actually a good foundation to build upon. So I am going to present some of the San Francisco context, and I think San Francisco is a unique place, and I can say that because I am not a native, but I've lived there 10 years now. Um, and in 2010, we offered antiretroviral therapy to all, regardless of CD4 count. In 2014, um, we started a getting to zero campaign citywide, zero new HIV infections, zero HIV deaths and um, zero HIV stigma. And I know New York State has a similar getting to zero initiative. And um, there are about 16,000 people living with HIV in San Francisco. It's actually a very dense but small city. Um, but what I highlighted here is that um, you can see the numbers of people 50 and older. Um, the other thing that's unique about San Francisco is it is still primarily um, a concentration of men who have sex with men make up the majority of HIV cases, and I think that is one of the unique demographic things of some, the San Francisco HIV AIDS epidemic compared to even, say, other parts of the Bay Area. But what I highlighted here are the, are the aging-related numbers. So right now, 63% of everyone with HIV in San Francisco is over the age of 50, and 26% are over the age of 65. So it's been this way since 2010, where more than half of everyone is over the age 50. So there is this urgent need to address HIV and aging issues. And I put this up because I think you also have to acknowledge the historical context of San Francisco and what many people who are aging with HIV lived through in the 80s and 90s. And this is a scene from downtown San Francisco in 1983. And so at Ward 86, for those of you who aren't familiar, it's housed on the campus of now Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, which is that Zuckerberg. Um, <laughs> And it's part of the San Francisco Health Network Clinics, which is the safety net system for the city and county of San Francisco. So we serve primarily publicly insured and uninsured people living with HIV. Um, we are a Ryan White funded clinic, and we have about 2,600 patients, about 1,500 who are over the age of 50. And so this is just almost a placeholder, but when we were trying to design a new HIV and aging care program, we took several things into consideration, which I'm going to go into more depth. So the first was actually the community perspective. So in 2010, the city of San Francisco, through the HIV and aging, or excuse me, the HIV Health Services Planning Council, who distributes the Ryan White funds for the city, as well as the mayor's long-term care coordinating committee, did a needs assessment of three counties, San Francisco, San Mateo, which is south, and Marin, which is north, and asked people what were their most pressing challenges. And the things were economic issues. In San Francisco, especially housing is a major concern for everyone. Um, but issues around transportation, food, food insecurity, housing, 
Um, isolation came up as well as the need for more, not a lack of knowledge of aging services. Around the same time, um, another movement was starting. I think it, one of the things I admire about um, being in the HIV field is that there's this tradition of advocacy, a lot that had to come in the 80s and 90s and people had to you know, fight and demand for treatment. But I think that tradition is continuing now in addressing aging related concerns. And so in 2013, there began to become a series of community forums specifically targeting what have now been called long-term survivors, um, trying to address some of these issues of isolation and other concerns that people who have been living with HIV for 20, 30 years found they were facing and that their needs were not being addressed. The photo is actually a photo of Tez Anderson and Matt Sharp, who started an organization called Let's Kick Ass, ASS standing for AIDS survivorship syndrome, which they dubbed as some of the PTSD and feelings that they're trying, trying to have a name for what they felt like they were going through when they realized everyone around them had gone, had died in the 80s and 90s. And so actually as a geriatrics fellow, I actually sat in on many of these forums and just sat and listened and kind of heard what some of the concerns were. And then, of course, we also took into account existing research. Um, this was a study we did at San Francisco, um, including the, um, in the SCOPE study. And this was when I, as a geriatrics fellow, I was trying to think about, well, how can we apply some of the principles from geriatrics and help understand what are the aging-related needs in people living with HIV? And so this just shows that many of these geriatric syndromes that we looked at were actually fairly common, you know, 25% reporting a difficulty with one or more activities of daily living or a fall, and things like depression being common in 40% of the people who had an average age of 57 but all had well-controlled HIV. And so from that, um, around the same time I was in my fellowship and doing research, um, Ward 86 and the 360 Positive Care Clinic, which is the HIV clinic on the UCSF main campus, where affiliate, UCSF is affiliated with um, San Francisco General as well as the San Francisco VA. And so the two clinics, the UCSF and the San Francisco General Clinic, um, were part of a demonstration project funded by the California HIV AIDS Research Program. And part of this project was really to understand more about the needs of people 50 and older with HIV and how could we start to try to integrate this into care. So this was dubbed the Silver Project and what the Silver Project did was patients would come in and undergo a series of screening assessments, either with a medical assistant or sometimes the nurses would do it. And they would undergo a lot of those same assessments that I showed in the previous slide, asking about falls, um, screening for depression and other mental health conditions, doing MOCA to look for cognitive impairment, um, asking about isolation and loneliness, and then some other things just asking about quality of life and, and adherence to HIV medicines. The results from all those assessments were put directly into the electronic medical record and then um, the results were communicated to the primary care provider, um, either so often by email, um, sometimes a message was put in their box. And then um, for patients who were more complex and the primary care provider felt like they needed more support, um, there would try to be an attempt to be a multidisciplinary case conference once a month where they could discuss um, the findings and address concerns. Um, the two sites operationalize things a little bit differently. And um, the Ward 86 site I can talk more about, and, and we did have the primary care providers come to those case conferences and bring up patients they wish to discuss. We also had a pharmacist as part of our team. And so what did we find in these assessments? So similar, um, many of the conditions were, were common. So falls were reported in 40% of the patients. Um, active de dependency in ADLs and IADLs. Um, loneliness was actually very common. Close to 60% of people reported at least mild symptoms of loneliness. And a third had, um, depending on the cutoff you use for the MOCA, would have an abnormal potentially diagnosis of cognitive impairment. And then another 55% had at least mild symptoms of depression. So again, this, this need, <laughs> And we also looked at polypharmacy with our pharmacist who sits at Ward 86, 
And he independently at the time went with, met with 248 patients and reviewed all their medications. On average, they were taking 14. Most were not their HIV medications, not surprisingly. And 16% were taking 20 or more medications. And when we looked at some geriatric prescribing measures, about 60% had one or more potentially inappropriate medications. Um, what that is is there are lists, the beers criteria and the stop-start criteria, which are used in people in geriatrics, often for people 65 and older, to say maybe these are drugs you should avoid, whether it's through pharmacokinetic or ph pharmacodynamic um, changes that occur with aging. And actually, when a pharmacist was going through and reviewing all of these, he actually um, identified in the moment contraindicated drug-drug interactions and 9% of the patients where he actually felt like he needed to call the PCP and say we need to make an immediate change. And that might be, for example, um, being on fluticasone with, um, you know, a boosted PI and the concern for development of Cushing syndrome. So, you know, just because it's whatever the electronic medical record list is not always accurate is another key point here. Um, and he actually did brown bag visits, and everyone physically brought in their pills, and he really tried to reconcile. And this publication um, is going to be coming out soon. And so we did, so we took the community needs assessment, and we used that information. We then had this demonstration project um, and learned more about the needs of some of our patients. So then what we did was when the project finished, we actually did surveys um, and focus groups with the patients and the providers at Ward 86 to say what, what was useful of this project we did. And so this is actually just comparing, you know, I showed that list of different assessments that people went through and which of the assessments were most important to both patients as well as to the healthcare providers. And so, you can see the patients right, rated depression, their HIV medication adherence, and social support as the top three. Providers ranked falls, memory concerns, and depression as the top three. But if you look between the two lines, they might be in different order, but it's actually the same six things. Um, I would point out social support and loneliness are not the exact same constructs, but they're related. And so actually this to me, said actually patients and providers are thinking about similar things or identifying similar concerns, which is encouraging. And this is where we should focus some of our assessments and what things we should focus on uh, as we revise the program. So then um, last year we did a series of focus groups. So we did the surveys, which gave us some initial data. And then we did two different focus groups with providers and four different patient focus groups, each with about 10 people. Um, there was a group of MSM, a group of women, um, a group of people who had acquired HIV through injection drug use. And then after we had done those groups, I felt like some of the older patients, 70 and older, were identifying some different concerns. So then we did another group that was more focused on older adults, as well as um, we had a few people from other clinics to get a sense of you know, what type of care models are feasible in different systems. And so common themes were really that people needed help navigating services. I remember it was, it's heartbreaking and, you know, people said, I didn't, I didn't think I was going to be here. And so I am completely unprepared. I am not sure, you know, what to do. I know how to manage my HIV, but I don't know how to manage my diabetes. And I and concerned about not knowing how to access senior focused services, knowing the HIV services, but not the aging services. And actually the name of our program, Golden Compass, came out of a focus groups as well. No one wanted the word HIV in the name. No one wanted the word older, geriatrics, or age in the name. But because of this theme of wanting to navigate, we started to think of the compass, and the golden comes from the fact out of all the four focus groups of patients, golden years was the one term that came up that was acceptable to use to describe aging. So we came up with the name golden compass, which is meant helping people with HIV navigate their golden years. So that's the tagline of our program. And what were some of the other things that came out from the program? So then we went with the compass theme and said, 
we're going to have the points of the compass and focus in on the areas that patients and providers told us they were concerned about. So the northern point you can see we call our heart is the heart and mind, and it's really describing um, the cardiovascular disease risk that that providers felt, the patients felt like they couldn't self-manage their other comorbid conditions, so trying to have some emphasis on dealing with other comorbidities. Mental health concerns was another common theme in the focus groups, and then, and also when we asked people about depression was in the top three for both patient and providers, as well as cognitive concerns. The eastern point we've dubbed bones and strength, which is focused on uh, the presence of geriatric syndromes that we saw and that patients actually had concerns about falls and their bone density because they knew that there was something going on with HIV and bone density. Um, and in our geriatric consult clinic, we addressed that. We've also, um, I'll talk more, but we're also, another theme was looking at low cost exercise classes. So I think to the comment this morning, you can say exercise, but um, many people feel they don't have the means to do that. They want to have a gym membership, but they can't afford it. Um, so we often talk about walking, but um, this was a real concern with people felt like they needed low cost exercise options. The Western point is focused on other kind of traditional aging screenings. So we're actually focused on hearing, vision, and dental because patients um, felt like they were sometimes able to get the screenings, but then they couldn't actually afford the eyeglasses or the hearing aids. For those of you who don't know, Medicare does not cover hearing aids. Um, some Medicaid plans do, so it actually is a real barrier. You can help someone and say, I'm gonna uh, give you a hearing test and we're gonna identify hearing loss and help improve your quality of life, but then you can't afford the hearing aids. So that, that was another theme that came up. And then the big one across all groups, whether it was MSM, whether it was women, was the loneliness, isolation, feeling stigmatized, and really wanting to form connections, not just with people with HIV, but really other older adults going through the same thing. So they didn't necessarily want to have groups with younger people in the clinic. They felt there was something unique and a need to be with other people their age. And then this theme around navigation and connecting to aging services. So uh, since January of this year, um, we, um, Dr. Priscilla Shu, who many of you may know is a cardiologist with HIV expertise, she now has a twice a month half day clinic in co-located in Ward 86 so that we can eliminate that barrier and people can come into clinic and also be seen by her um, to address um, current concerns about cognition, we partnered, we've partnered with a community gerontologist who offers um, brain health classes just to explain how memory works, um, how you can overcome depression. Um, and then in our geriatrics consult clinic, we do cognitive evaluations and help connect people to resources. Um, and we're, uh, I know Shireen yesterday presented the Memory and Aging Center study. I am a huge referrer. I send a lot of patients with cognitive symptoms um, her way so that they can potentially um, participate and benefit from the study. And then the Eastern Point um, at San Francisco General Hospital, there's a wellness center that offers exercise classes. We've partnered with one of the instructors to try to offer a time when just our patients can come, because many of them still feel stigmatized accessing spaces they don't know and aren't familiar. Um, amazingly, the San Francisco Health Network Clinic System does not have a DEXA machine. So we actually have partnered with Radiology, who has also been wanting to get a DEXA machine for the city and county. Um, and we put in a proposal, which we're hoping to hear back, to try to get a DEXA machine for our patients. Um, to have, we can send people to the UCSF campuses, um, but they can't get it on site um, on the hospital campus where we're located. And then a big part of um, the Friday afternoon geriatric clinic is focused on falls and balance evaluations and addressing fall risk. The Western point we are asking about now age appropriate vision and hearing screening. And we have partnered, um, we had one partnership with Lens Crafters and we're looking into others to actually provide low cost eyeglasses and working with our audiology clinic to access 
um, improved resources to get people hearing aids, um, working with the University of Pacific and other dental clinics to get improved access for dental care. And then the southern point, um, we've been uh, trying to figure out if we're going to start a support group. Um, we've learned that many community agencies also have a lot of support groups, so we're trying to find a niche that does not um, overlap, um, but that we can either refer to existing agencies for existing groups, um, and they can refer to us. Um, one of the things I, I've noticed is that there's less groups for women. Some are solely focused on men, and so we may revamp our group to focus on women initially. And then we've also been, we're going to be starting here soon around um, just activities where people can come together and it's not feel like a formal group, but if they want to come, have a meal, um, share in an activity to help foster that sense of community. Because um, in our first off, the last offering of one of the classes we did, that's what we saw and that's what we hoped is that people over the eight weeks of the brain health class, whether it does anything for their memory, it will at least have some establishment of new relationships. And then the other thing is, is educating um, staff and um, need for increased knowledge of aging services amongst the social workers. And we just got a social work intern who is um, who had done a lot of work with older LGBT adults. And so he has some familiarity with aging services. And we've been linking our existing clinic social workers to trainings offered by the Department of Adult and Aging Services. And uh, that's just the four points, but because of our polypharmacy data um, in the previous thing, our pharmacist is going through and reviewing medications with everything. We're starting a partnership with the AIDS Legal Referral Program to um, link people so that they can come on site and have their advanced care directives and power of attorneys notarized on site. Many people may not have the ability to get two witnesses, so that's a way of still allowing people to document their preferences. I mentioned the knowledge issues. Um, I know I'm running short on time, but right now how it's currently operationalized, um, Friday afternoon we have our geriatric clinic. Um, the person comes in, they meet with the pharmacist, go through all their medications. Um, the medical assistant I've worked with has learned how to do MOCA, so he does the MOCA for me and does a PHQ-2 or a PHQ-4, because that actually helps me if I don't have to do the test and I can interpret the results and then go through everything else. Um, and so, so we're doing MOCA, we're doing mental health, I'm asking about function, um, we're, tr we're trying to get a sense of their environment and their social supports, and then asking about geriatric syndromes. Um, like I said, not ready for data yet, but we have seen 63 new referrals. Probably the average age is around 62. The range has been between 49 to 81. I had a provider email me who said, I have this 49-year-old who's falling in a lot of concerning meds. And I said, absolutely. We shouldn't just say, because you're 49, you can't come here. Um, and again, the, the demographics are reflective of, of the clinic in San Francisco. Um, so far, over half of the providers have referred at least one patient, so trying to get a sense of the provider uptake. And the most common reasons for referrals are just a general consultation. A lot of times that means the person has multiple conditions, I'm not sure what to do, or I just want you to look and help me figure out what else I should be doing, you know, if there's a balance problem. Cognitive concerns is a huge reason. That's the second most common reason people are being referred. Um, and, it, and it's tricky to sort out with the MOCA <laughs> and, and the limited time I have. Falls is another one, as well as medication concerns. And, and so I think when we made it on the front page of the San Francisco Chronicle, to me, that said, you know, we've struck a nerve here. Um, this is clearly something that's needed. Um, and and that, that hopefully the community will support. Obviously, it's not all, <laughs> it's not all perfect, and these are a lot of things we're trying to do. Um, the biggest challenge is actually the funding. Um, because of the current healthcare climate, we're in the city and county of San Francisco, and they have to prioritize their spending, and with constant threats against the Affordable Care Act, and the concern that there's gonna be an influx of more patients to our safety net system, it's hard for them to want to sponsor new initiatives. And so this is something we're having ongoing discussions with on the city. Right now, we're funded by AIDS Walk San Francisco, who has contributed for the first two years. 
Um, but this is something that we're still looking for is sustainable funding. We actually don't accept private insurance. So I've had been contacted by patients who have private insurance who would like to come. So we're actually, we, we may end up being the pilot case for the county hospital to bill private insurance. Um, and then there are just general implementation challenges. I would say you gotta start one thing at a time. If you launch multiple programs, at, even multiple classes at one time, it, um, it can be overwhelming to, to advertise that for the patients to understand where things are. So we're, we're going one at a time now. And then the other challenge is just the electronic medical record and, and how do you get all the outcomes you want to collect. A lot of it we're doing from Excel spreadsheets and access databases because the EMR just doesn't have the capacity to collect the data we want to have. And we're going to switch EMR in another year. So it also doesn't make sense to put a lot into the record. But it's a challenge. Um, and then I think just general, and I think this will be part of the discussion, is who do we target? Myself, I can't see all 1,500 people over 50. So how do we prioritize this? Um, one thing we've done is we built in some like HIV testing. You got to opt out of a geriatrics referral in a couple situations. We're trying to get everyone 70 and older in the clinic to come in. Um, and also anyone who's had a fall so that they can have a more comprehensive fall assessment and reduce their risk of future falls. And then I think the role of the consultant, which came up a little this morning in one of the presentations, and, and um, you know, should it just be a one-time consultation? Many patients want to come back. Even though I get an hour, I didn't mention that I get an hour for my initial visit, it is sometimes still not enough. You just feel like you're starting to, to hit the surface um, and you can't really do it all in one visit. And then, you know, some providers have already suggested, you know, this patient is really complicated. I actually would like a co-management strategy and should there be a role for that? And then I think just the, the challenge of demonstrating value to the healthcare system um, for funding. And I think in general, geriatrics sometimes hasn't clearly branded itself as to what we do, what we can offer to patients. Um, and so that can be a challenge. And I think, again, along the lines this morning, it's not just assessment. Um, and you actually have to intervene. And we know not just from um, the data that they presented from Cornell, but this is true of all literature on comprehensive geriatrics ass assessment. You have to have more of an intervention. You can't just leave the recommendations because they'll sit in a note somewhere. Um, and so we're actually actively making a lot of the referrals ourselves now because even in the first six months, the feedback we got was, it's okay, just send the referral, even make the medication change, which is a geriatrician. I still email the provider because I don't want multiple, multiple providers prescribing. It's my pet peeve. So I email the providers and say, this is what I'm going to do to the medications. I don't just do it unless, some, unless there's an extreme situation. There's been some people who've been profoundly orthostatic and have had a fall, and I will just discontinue an antihypertensive in that situation. Um, I think there's still a lot of, I think this is still new, and while we do need to have services now, I think there's still a lot more evidence that we need for what are the best practices. And I think one thing I would love for all the neurocognitive people in the room is, um, what is the simple screening tool you can do in a real world clinical setting that has maybe is a little more sensitive than the MOCA? Um, we're looking at MOCA plus and what the plus is. There's, we have a lot of intensive debate about right now. Um, and then I think, you know, how would you, how would you do this in a different setting? There's, you know, there's different models for HIV care. Some people are doing primary care and really doing everything for the patient in one place. Others are really just doing the HIV management and are co-managing with internal medicine or family medicine. And then how do you weave in geriatrics? If you don't have geriatrics, is, what are the assessments you can do as an HIV doctor? And then of course, you know, even in our clinic, there are space and time constraints, let alone if you are working in Uganda or um, another part of the world. I know both of the talks today are, are US based and I think it's important that we also have to think about in, even in Europe or other places where there's a totally different healthcare system, the model is likely going to be different. And so what are the key pieces you can take um, away to transfer to your own setting? And so we're up for time, but I think in summary, you know, you have to 
engage all the key stakeholders, the patients, the providers, the community, and that's what we did to help inform the development of our program. And that really the ideal model for HIV and aging, you know, still to be determined, we'll have some outcome data which will hopefully help inform, but I think a lot of it is also going to be using implementation science. This, I think that's what this title means to me, and how can we adapt things based on local resources. So I'll end with that. I just want to acknowledge um, Monica Gandhi, who is the medical director of Ward 86, um, Diane Havler, who is the chief of our HIV ID and global medicine division, and then across the bottom are the amazing Golden Compass team members. It does really take a village to also help an older adult. Uh, Helen, our social worker, Mary is the RN, Bill is the one who's learned to do the mochas, he's our medical assistant, Janet, our pharmacist, Cyril at the front desk, and then Mary Lawrence and Eva, our deputy clinic managers. So thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.